The topic which I'll try and address is about science and engineering for our planet's future. Now, if you look at the state of our planet today, look back about 30 years from now, and look ahead to, let's say, 2050, we can ask, what can we learn from what happened in the last few decades uh, and what we, uh, how can we predict the future? Now, let's pretend we are in 2050. Over several decades now, 20 historians of the future had warned us of the dark paths we have taken as humans. And those portents will come with evidence. We humans, those who are wielded and wield power and wealth, those historians said, have snatched nature's dice and played our own game. Nature rolls out its dice and, and, and you know, it's done in a random manner. But however, nature's dice has favored, has been loaded in favor of humans for a long time now. The mysteries of Prithvi, Jal, Vayu, Akash, and Agni, Earth, the oceans, air, the skies, and energy were seemingly ours and only ours to understand. In understanding this, we humans have also become nature's engineers. Now, as stewards of the planet, we are faced with great responsibility of sustainable development for all while conserving biodiversity, the environment, and dealing with climate change. In this landscape, a new and mighty power has emerged, developed and controlled by a few, promising to serve the many and rescue us all. Will it take us and the planet to a new and bright future, or will it create a new, dehumanized dystopia? That is the question the historians of the future debated in the 2020. Our world of 2050 will have two possible extreme manifestations and everything in between. We would have either taken our planet back from the brink or let it continue to careen in a change. The choice is up. Now, if you go to big industrial houses and consultancy firms today and ask them how 2050 will look like, they will give you a rosy picture about what the economy will look like. And that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about emerging economies and how they will succeed, but we're talking about fundamental nature of our planet and how its state is, not just about the economy. The Earth was born a little over 4.5 billion years ago, and the sun and solar system a little earlier. Uh, amazingly, life came about on Earth a relatively short while after it was born. Now, this life we know today has common origins. Uh, all life on Earth has common origins and shared chemistry, and the shared chemistry is linked by the thread of DNA. And therefore, understanding any organism allows us to understand every other organism. And the theory of evolution by natural selection, uh, formulated by Charles Darwin uh, and Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, tells us all this. And this is no longer a theory. The evidence for molecular biology shows how natural selection actually works. Now, about 65 million years ago, something amazing happened. Uh, we think an asteroid struck the Earth uh, and destroyed the dominant large life form on the planet, the dinosaurs, and allowed mammals to, to grow and develop. This picture here is of a, a Barapsaurus tagori in the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata and was uh, put together by Pamela Robinson. So not only have we understood how... Sorry, not only have we understood how... Uh, you know, life on Earth has evolved, but in trying to understand nature's engineering, we have actually understood all the details of the mechanisms involved. Uh, we have the structure of DNA, which was solved by Crick and Watson, Rosalind Franklin, Morris Wilkins, and others. And this understanding has told us how the molecular mechanisms, how cells, tissues, and life forms are made, and more importantly, in terms of the context of what we have done to Earth today, how they can be manipulated. One of the consequences of a better and better understanding is the understanding of how the human brain is. And from this understanding, we know that we are unusual amongst primates in having a much larger brain for our body mass compared to other non-human primates. Now, given this context of how we have evolved, our ability to make tools, 
have language and cultural evolution and engineer nature. We have escaped in some ways the limitation of biological uh, evolution and have transformed the world. This has resulted in us changing the earth in a manner which is just absolutely unprecedented. Now, as we look at what will happen to earth in 2050, we have to address four aspects, humans, climate, biodiversity, and environment. Now, because of our language ability, our ability to make tools, communicate, our cultural evolution has transformed this planet. We have moved from being the uh, you know, survivors on this planet to wielders of the paintbrush. This has resulted in what is known as the McCready evolution, where uh, uh, Carver McCready pointed out that 10,000 years ago, human population plus our livestock and pets was approximately 1% of vertebrate biomass. Today, over billions of years on a unique sphere, chance has painted a thin covering of life, complex, improbable, wonderful, and fragile. Suddenly, we humans have grown in population, technology, and intelligence to a position of terrible power. We now wield the paintbrush, says Daniel Dennett, a uh, neuro philosopher. Now, how has this happened? Uh, there are some stark examples of this, and one of them is uh, in the, you know, uh, what, what happened on July 16th at the Trinity site in New Mexico in 1945. And this uh, picture is 16 milliseconds after one proposed start of the Anthropocene epoch uh, showing the uh, A-bomb. Uh, this left, uh, left a footprint for all of future to detect. Another example is uh, the Haber-Bosch process through which humans got the ability to extract nitrogen from the environment, make ammonia, and thereby remove restraints on agricultural growth and therefore on population growth too. So the alchemy of air, in other words, uh, showed how one could transform agriculture and also create other kinds of earth. All of this led to a growth uh, to various industrial revolutions. There is Mahatma Gandhi in Manchester in 1931, uh, uh, with uh, families of workers. And these industrial revolutions consistently developed our planet into a way by which we extracted natural resources, energy, developed markets in a manner which completely and steadily changed the planet. Each time there was a shortage, people used to say human ingenuity will find a way to get out of it, whether it's an environmental problem or a shortage of mineral resources and so on. And indeed, humans have become a very adept at solving every kind of problem. But the consequences of this kind of development has been asymmetry and also impact on a variety of other contexts on the planet, uh, particularly as we will come to now, climate. Here's a picture of uh, I took uh, flying over uh, Everest in November 2016. And such a picture in 2050, you will find uh, far less uh, snows on these mountains. And in 2016, it's far less than it was 20, uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So climate change, global warming, has actually transformed fragile ecosystems such as the Himalayas, the poles, leading to extraordinary changes, uh, adverse extreme weather events, which we will have to deal with both through adaptation and mitigation as we go forward. A consequence of climate change uh, has been the uh, increased proximity between humans and other animals in a manner where spillover events can happen more like traditionally uh, pandemics and epidemics have arisen out of proximity between uh, other animals and humans. But this traditional way of transmission, such as seen in this uh, illustration of this book, Spillover by David Foreman, is likely to change in new ways because of climate. Here is an example of an antelope in Kazakhstan, which large numbers of which died because of an increased temperature uh, resulted in commensal bacteria invading the bloodstream and causing sepsis. So climate change can affect uh, zoonotic diseases uh, or also cause pandemics in new ways. 
Now, let's come to biodiversity. Uh, biodiversity is something very critical for the survival of the planet and indeed of humans. You have ants which, you know, um, nurture aphids, which eat fungi, which, you know, deal with large forest uh, uh, undercovers in, in extraordinary ways. All of that can be affected in ways which can have transformative effects on our lives. So biodiversity is something which human intervention, anthropomorphic intervention, has changed rather uh, dramatically, and that's something which also one needs to address going on to 2050. Finally, we look at the environment. Humans have actually dramatically changed the environment because of economic reasons, and these are best illustrated by works of Sapata Dasupta, an economist in Cambridge. Sapata pointed out very beautifully that there are inventions such as the deep ocean fishing trawlers, um, the chainsaw, which have transformed the economy. But the result of that is, is that it's also transformed the environment. And because we want frugal, inexpensive, high quality products now, we postpone the payments to the cost of the environment to future generations. The result of these inventions then is a comfortable lifestyle for few at this stage today and a disaster for the environment for the future. So we must now learn to pay for environmental costs now while having increased standards of living, and that's a big challenge. Now let me end by saying, which are the directions we can take and what should we do? Alan Turing, in 1950, 100 years before our 2050 report on Spaceship Earth, said very clearly that we can only see a short distance ahead but we can see plenty that needs to be done. So that's, of course, absolutely true when we go towards what we need to do on Spaceship Earth for 2050. The challenges we have today are products of a 20th century mindset where nations, economies, big companies drive their agenda in a manner which does not look at the planet as a whole. To look at the planet as a whole, we need to have a much broader. How can we bring that about? It seems an impossible task for everyone to put aside their immediate interest and come together in the interest of the planet. The solution is not easy to envisage. It will be even more difficult to implement. But at the core of the solution lies science and technology and scientists for the people and people for science. Unless we open up access to science to a very large number of people, to education, particularly access uh, to science, to women all over the world, unless we are prepared to have programs which instill in us a way of appreciating a global collaboration to save the planet, we will not have a happy 2050. This is possible, uh, that is, a, a global collaboration is possible by having a new approach to science which puts at its center the solution to problems which we face today and not individual success, institutional success, or even national success. Can we put in place such a science collaborator? If we can, we can save the planet. So what matters is what lies six inches behind an eyepiece of a complex instrument. This can change the planet, and this is what we must try. Thank you.